Let's start with the first slide. You see the Sphinx and there's a steel, which is a stone, granite stone, and this was put there by Tutmos IV, long after the Sphinx was built. The whole antiquity of the Sphinx and the pyramids at Giza has been in question for many years, and there are many hypotheses as to how old they are. Early historians attributed the Great Pyramid to Pharaoh Khufu. It's about 2,500 years before Christ. Lots of people have come along and said, well, this is all nonsense, but uh, they don't want to believe that people before the Egyptians built the pyramid. So the recent evidence is that they were built about 12,500 BC. That's about um, 14,500 years ago. And there they are. Some believe that the Egyptian Sphinx was not a Sphinx, but it was a lion or a dog. And several historians and, and archaeologists have uh, <laughs> suggested that. Now this is a very ancient uh, Sphinx, and that's the, the head of one of the pharaohs. And you see it's been carved from granite. Do you think that these people, they could do that with copper tools? Anyone knows how to carve granite? Tungsten carbide tips, chisels, and uh, you've got to be careful not to crack it. Not easy to make a sort of thing like that several thousand years ago. Now this is the shape of an anubis, and you'll see that the, the head shape and the body shape is completely wrong for the, the pyramid. And of course those ears will be broken off very quickly. So it's not a very sensible shape for um, something that's got to last several thousand years. The name Sphinx is of Greek origin. It's not a, an Egyptian name. And it means an enigmatic mythical beast with a lion's body, wings, a woman's head and breasts, which strangled its victims. It was, for instance, the protector of the treasure houses at Delphi. It was, call, uh, it was called an androsphinx if it had a male head, and a cryosphinx with a ram's head, and a hierocosphinx with a hawk's head like the griffin. The etymological derivation of the word in Greek, uh, sphix, to draw tight, or sphysia, to strangle, sphinx, or strangler, to suffocate. I don't think that was the original intention of it, but that's what the um, Greeks wanted to believe it was. But it certainly was a protector of the treasure houses in Egypt. Now this is the Assyrian temples in the Valley of the Kings, and those are very, very ancient, some of them. These buildings state, or this stonework, goes back beyond 10,000 BC, and probably built before the pyramids and before the Sphinx was put there. These uh, stone blocks are extremely heavy and it's not known how they were placed there, how they were cut so accurately. It's quite remarkable for that period and the other thing about the stones is they're, they are chamfered. We, we only see chamfered stones in South America and on the walls of the Great Pyramid. Now here is one of the latest archaeological sites to be found, and it's in Gobleki in Turkey, and it's said to be about 12,000 years old. That's because they've got something there to do some carbon dating with. Now, if that's 12,000 years old, this is quite well developed as against these temples that you saw, or that a siren you saw before this. This type of construction is very similar to that in Malta, Toxian temple, in Malta with similar construction methods. You see you've got the rectangular blocks and then you've got the very small stone walls around in a circular shape. If you then look back at the Karnak temple, those pillars, you see some people there? You see the size of those things. Now there's no Greek or Roman temple that comes anywhere near that. And the Roman temples are all straight. You see that these are beautifully carved and they've got beautiful capitals on the top. This picture was taken a few years ago, so you see the amount of erosion and, and what they've had to do to recover the, the face of some of these pillars. And this is due to uh, acid rain, which comes from motor cars and uh, the environment. This other part is a, it's part of a wall of Karnak, but it's thought that all, all this was um, carved on there way after the temple was built. Now on the right you see Dendera. Now this temple was built 
in the reign of Cleopatra. And it's a very feminine building. It's very beautiful, in fact. And uh, it, it's the best example or best surviving example of Egyptian architecture. And that's what an artist's impression was of the Dendera temple to Isis Hathor. You see the, the female heads at the top there, very much after Cleopatra's patronage. And that's the outside of the building. I think it's absolutely beautiful. All right, so let's look at the Sphinx itself. If you have wind erosion, you'll see you have sharp edges. And even if you have water erosion or rainfall erosion, you have rounded edges. Now, when you look at the Sphinx as it stands now, do you see sharp edges? Do you see things like that? That's sharp edge erosion. You've got partial wind erosion and you've got partial water erosion. And of course, about 12,005 years ago, it was tropical there and they had a lot of rain. And you'll see these grooves at the front of the pyramids and this indicates water erosion. Now, another uh, thing about the Sphinx is that the head is very much out of proportion with the body. I put the same profile as the inset granite Sphinx there, and you'll see that the head is just not right, is it? And that's because it's been carved to suit the various pharaohs that followed, and for a long time the, the rest of the body was buried and only the head showed above the ground. So I think for some eons, they thought that the only thing that was there was the head. And it's only later that the sand was taken away and they found all sorts of other things there. So this is the Assyrian Sphinx, which is about 2500 BC. Now you see the erosion that takes place on the face of those Sphinx. So here you have the Assyrian culture, which dates back to 2500 BC, as I said before. And that's what the Sphinx looks like inside. One of the great things about the mysteries surrounding the Sphinx is what sort of head did it have? Did it have a lion's head? Did it have a female head or a masculine head? Now, I'll, I'll come to those things later, and you'll see as we go along that it's fairly certain it was a human head. Because all the um, ancient cultures that came after the Egyptian, or whilst the Egyptian culture was going on, copied the Sphinx. And these cultures all have a human head on their sphinx, and they also have wings. This is a, a lion's body, or sometimes it's a cloven hoof being, but usually it's a lion's body. It's got wings, it's got a human head, and some sort of headdress. Now, the steel in front of the sphinx. You see there, there are two sphinx. There's not one. They've been looking for this sphinx. And they think they've found it now, but we'll come back again to that just now. But you see they are making offerings to these Sphinx. And what is underneath the Sphinx is the treasure house. The human head on the Sphinx on the steel is in the correct proportion. Now we come back to this jackal's head again. You see this funerary jackal that was in the tomb of Tutankhamun. And uh, you see, if you, if you look at the shape of the body, and the length of the tail, and how the whole thing relates to the Sphinx, it certainly wasn't a jackal. These are ram-headed Sphinx that you see at the Karnak Temple entrance, but they've got a human in front of them. And it's, they, were, they were used there as protectors of the temple. The Persians ruled Egypt from 524 BC, and the Greeks ruled Egypt from 322 BC. Now, the Persians and the Greeks were very familiar with all things Egyptian. They did not seek to destroy Egypt's culture, but the Romans did ruthlessly in 30 AD. The Greek culture was similar to the Egyptian culture regarding women who were treated as equals. But in Rome, they were not. And that lasted for many centuries. Now, the griffin, the griffin is, a, is also a legendary guardian, a creature with a head, beak, and wings of a raptor and the body of a lion, the tail of a serpent, or lion, or scorpion. And these guarded Scythian gold and precious stones. The, there was a, a story about them said, uh, spread by the Scythians around the countries around them to say that if you went and started scratching over there, you would find uh, large bones. And those are the bones of these griffins. And if you went in there, the griffins would get you. <laughs> Whether there was a griffin there, griffin there or not, but they have discovered dinosaur bones there. Now this is a, a sphinx 
that I took a photograph of. It's a very rare sphinx that was bought in 1940 by uh, one of the military people during the war. This has got wings on it, and they insist that the sphinx did not have wings, the Egyptians, but there it is. Now, I want you to note the attachment places for the wings on the sphinx. Now, I keep on referring to other sphinx around the, the world. This is um, in Russia, in Petersburg, and that was the Manitop three. And uh, you see the head, the, the beard has been knocked off, but the headdress is of Upper and Lower Egypt. And uh, you see it sitting on a plinth, it's got a lion's body, human head, but no wings, because it's a much later sphinx. Note the tail position. This is an Indian sphinx, and it's got wings. You see that? That's the sphinx from Darius's palace, Persia. It's got a head, wings, lion's body, and it's resting on a plinth. And that's a Chinese sphinx, but it's got a, an indistinct head, not sure whether it's a dog or whether it's a lion, but it has wings and you see the position of the tail. The symbolism for these parts of the Sphinx are that the headdress indicates a leader. The human head is related to fire, the beard to wisdom, the wings air, the lion's body water, and the plinth earth. This is a Phoenician Sphinx. You see the Phoenician Sphinx, lion's body, wings, human head, and a headdress. That's a departure, that's in St. Mark's Square in Venice. Lion's body, lion's head, but wings. Now this is a Greek sphinx. This is a sort of sphinx that would guard the treasure house. And this was, I believe, because this, both of these are at Delphi, the one on the right was representing the oracle of Delphi, and the one on the left was representing the guardian. Well, you can imagine that. It doesn't look very happy or very pleasant, does it, the one on the left? There's more feminine than the one on the right. And you look at the shape of the tail there. If you know a cat when it's not happy, its tail goes all over the place. And these are some a sphinx I saw in the Louvre. I took some pictures of them. The one lot, they were, there's the Greco-Roman sphinx that's the, between the two periods. And the one on the left, of course, has got a human head, lion's body and wings. And the other one's got a, a lion's head, but it's got horns and wings. This is an Indian sphinx, but it hasn't got any wings. A lion's body and a human head. Now, there is a difference in terms of astrology. Western astrology will say, well, um, you haven't got the air, fire and water things quite right. But ancient, ancient Egyptology and uh, Greek mythology, they refer to earth, water, air and fire in, in a different way to say like a bull, lion, eagle and man. So you'll see there that there's a, a slight difference between them. Earth is still a bull, okay? Western astrology, a lion is fire, but in um, Egyptian and Greek mythology, it's emotion, okay? Or it's water. And um, Scorpio is, is an eagle, and that's air in the Egyptian mythology. An Aquarius man is usually air, and it's fire and the spirit Egyptology. Going back to the, the time of 12,500 BC, the three pyramids align perfectly with Orion's belt. And the Sphinx is positioned um, where the spring equinox would be, which would be in Leo at that time. You also have the procession of the equinoxes. Now what's happened is we've gone halfway through the procession of the equinoxes, and now man, is at the bottom. Lion's at the top, eagle at the left, and bull on the right. You see, so we've gone a, um, about 180 degrees through that. So this is this what they call um, a Kali Yug. We're going through Kali Yug and going out of that into Aquarius. 12,500 years ago, it indicates what was there in, the, in that period was that these fixed signs were, as I said before, were with man at the top, and that is a, is a symbol of the Sphinx. That's the age of Pisces, okay? That's before it moves into Aquarius. Now you see on the, the number 10 card in the Sphinx, you've got the whole picture of what it all represents. First of all, you've got the Sphinx at the top. You've got the other parts which represent the three brains of a human being. This is the three elements you see here. 
of the reptile, the mammalian, and that's a human with an animal head, and the sphinx at the top, okay, which is what we call the central three. And on the outside, you've got the, the four root yogas, okay, which are, uh, this is Hatha Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, uh, Jinani Yoga, and Raja Yoga. And these are the symbols of human development and the basic things you need for you to develop spiritually. And of course, man's development is with its, with its reptile brain, which if you believe in uh, Darwin's theories of evolution, this is how we evolved, and, but there is still a missing link. But nevertheless, they say that the, these, these, all these parts of our brain were developed along those lines, and we were ape-like, if you like, and then we became human. This is a symbol of the realized person. So the Sphinx really is a symbol of a realized person. There are alchemical elements here. This is salt, which is um, to do with inertia, water, which is to do with movement, and sulfur to do with the, um, in the Ayurvedic sense, this is uh, a, a tamasic, and this is uh, rajistic here. And uh, of course, here is mercury, which is the symbol for the alchemist realized person. So there you are, bulls, the physical body, lions, emotion, eagle's wings, and human head, fire, and spirit. Now you can see very easily what the Sphinx is all about. That's descending man and that's ascending man by alchemy and the law. Now another thing about this uh, here, this uh, anagram, Torah or Tarot or Rota, it's all to do with wheel. Rota in Latin is a wheel. And there you see the Sphinx again throughout the Tarot and the reason I use a Tarot is because the Tarot the major arcana actually represents 22 steps to enlightenment, if you did but know it. And uh, the chariot is bringing your sphinxes or your, your body or your emotions to rest. And of course the world is a very great indication of you having been realized, you are a realized being. When you get to 10, you're, you're not there yet. You're still in the process of evolution. But when you get to the world, then you and the world are one. Now, this is the Greek riddle of the Sphinx. And this is the Sphinx asking Oedipus to answer a riddle. And the riddle was, what walks on four legs in the morning, two legs at lunchtime, and three legs in the evening? So it's a baby in the morning, or an adult with the two legs, in the midday, and the old person with the stick, that's in the evening. Now on this dream steel, you'll see there are two sphinxes, as I said earlier. Now one's a male sphinx, and the other one is a female sphinx. And now they believe they found the place where the other sphinx is, because they're absolutely certain that there were two sphinx there, and, and there's a lot of historical evidence for it. The current sphinx is where you see it there, an aerial photograph, of the Sphinx, and that's where the rectangular shape there, that's where the other one is. But the directors of the Giza Plateau and of the Sphinx and the pyramids, they will not permit any work on that. They don't want to see what is there. They're worried that it will be revealed something quite different and it'll give people a lot of ideas about what is really, what the Sphinx is all about. And the front legs of the Egyptian Sphinx guard the entrance to a lower doorway between its front legs, and it's submerged. Deep changes below the Sphinx have recently been discovered, and I saw some uh, slides about that when I was in the year 2000 in the World Parliament Religions. There was a gentleman there from America who'd done some research there, and he was asked not to reveal what he's found by the Director of Antiquities there. But as soon as he left there, he, he went and started uh, telling everybody what was there. This further illustrates that this doorway may have been the entrance to secret vaults where ancient leaders kept their treasure. Well, it's, that's what, what, what we think now. 
is the fact. This could also symbolize spiritual treasure hidden in the secret vaults of our own being, if you're looking at the, the whole thing from an esoteric point of view. And we believe that this was built by a technically and spiritually advanced race of beings in a tropical period. Well, thank you uh, very much, Tom, for sharing all your um, hard research and, and wisdom and investigations into the Sphinx. I think it uh, sounds like the riddles uh, maybe slightly more clarified for us. Thank you. Thank you very much.